God is going to do something to bring more and more Mormons to him. Are you hearing this here? And I just hope that this message is a part of God's beautiful and precious plan um, for the Mormons, because I just my job here is not to bash Mormons or to do anything like that. My job is to simply present the truth the truth because there's a difference between what is the word of God and what is made up by some dude who is a very well-known storyteller, which is confirmed in history. That's all I'm going to say about that. But let's go, if you have your swords with you, let's go to Hebrews uh, chapter one and I'll put this up. Thank you. Thank you for noticing the haircut. So blessings to you. <laughs> That's Jeff. Appreciate the love. All right. So let's go to Hebrews chapter one. And this, I want to start. And let's go verse five. No, the Lord's telling me start at verse one. Okay, we'll go at verse one. Hebrews chapter one, verse one. Look at this. God, who at various times and in diverse ways spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the world. He is the brightness of his glory, the express image of himself and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He was made so much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than that. For to which of the angels did he at any time say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says that all the angels of God worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angel spirits in his service a flame of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, lasts forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, lay the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they all will wear out like a garment. As a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not end. Wow. Let me stop right there because that is very powerful. Because again, if you understand in Mormonism, especially in the Mormon church, the thing is, is that, well, number one, if you were here last week, we talked about that, but I'm just going to reiterate just a little bit. I laid the foundation last week. Now I'm just going to build off of it. So the thing is, when you look at the scripture, the thing is, is that Mormons believe that Jesus is the son of God, but you have to remember that God the father was once a man who ascended Godhood. And yes, there's also a heavenly mother. We have a heavenly mother. We have spiritual parents. And what happened was um, the firstborn son was Yeshua, was Jesus. Now, here's the thing, though. Jesus, Yeshua, is not created. So that right there is wrong. The Mormon belief is not in coincide with the teachings of Yeshua because they believe that Yeshua is our spiritual big brother. We pre-existed before we came to the earth. Oh, and I love mentioning this part. We were white. We were all white spiritual children before we came to the earth. And again, black people, the reason why we're black is because when we came before in our pre-existent life, we 
uh, there was a war in heaven between our big brother Yeshua and our big brother Satan. And what happened was um, Satan and his angels got kicked out. And what happened was black people, we remained neutral. We didn't pick a side. We didn't pick Jesus, nor did we pick um, Satan. So when we came to the earth, we were cursed with black skin. This isn't even just a made up fairy tale because the Mormon church, the second prophet after Joseph Smith, Brigham Young actually stated that being black was a curse. And any Mormon who, uh, who uh, dealt with or had relationship with a black man would be susceptible to the curse. I'm just giving the truth of that. That's what that was. But Simba, how come now we're seeing black people? It's few in number, but we see black people coming into uh, the church, into the Mormon church. That shows you right there that this is part Gnosticism because Gnosticism is not about truth or it's about revelation. It's about preference. It's about what you need. It's about um, what fits, what you need to fit. You understand this here. And that's why I'll say this on air. I'll say this live. Joseph Smith is a liar. He's a storyteller. He was a well-known storyteller before he even became the prophet for the Mormons. That's just a fact. I'm not here to hurt anybody's feelings or to make anyone angry, but I'm here to state the truth because that is what is needed. If you're going to tell me that, especially Mormons, you're going to tell me that this is the true Jesus, this is, or it's the same Jesus, I will tell you, you are a bold-faced liar because that Jesus is not the Jesus that is revealed in Scripture. The Jesus that is revealed in the Bible is the God from the beginning as confirmed in Hebrews chapter 1. He is in the class and rank of capital G, God. He is God the Son. You understand this here? He was not created. He existed at the beginning with God. Are you hearing this here? He is the creator of all things. So that means if he is the creator of all things, he cannot be created. Thank you. Are you understanding this here? But what I don't like is that people in the body of Christ the thing is, the reason why these cults, and yes, I say that, these cults have gotten so big and huge is because the body of Christ, you went to sleep on them. You were like, well, we don't want nothing to do with that. You started playing my salvation as for myself, and you started playing self-preservation because you were afraid of becoming defiled by the false teaching when you are the one who was supposed to have the truth. These cults have gotten so big, it's because the body of Christ, you ain't speaking up to correct or to speak the truth. Somebody out here saying an angel named Maroni came to me and says that I'm a prophet and the church is corrupt and I'm here as one of God's prophets to rewrite the doctrine. And one of the doctrine is that we pre-existed and that we were all white and that the black race was created because they were neutral. But the white people, you kept your white hood because you sided with Jesus. You thought it was a good idea. So you still keep the, com you still keep the complexion of your spirit hood. Are you kidding me? Where was the church during this time? Instead of persecuting, you should have been talking. You should have been using the word as the sword of the spirit to tear down this demonic stronghold. 
It's then we got a whole state dedicated with this cult. Go to Utah. It is Mormon galore. How did a whole how did a whole cult get a whole state? No, we need to do exactly what that song we did in praise and worship. We need to take back what the enemy stole. Utah is for God. It is not for Mormons. Are you hearing this here? Ah, so now let me um, give you guys um, some information. Let's talk about Joseph Smith for a minute because the Lord said what? That there will be many false prophets who come in the last days, right? He said that there will be prophets who will come in my name. They will do this. They will say this. They will sound like they know what they're talking about. But really, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. And he said one of the ways you will know them is that you will know them by their what? By their fruit. You will also know them by how they speak. Notice how in the scripture that in Hebrews chapter 1, it says all the prophets. Some of the prophets? No. All of the prophets were called by who? God, right? They were called by God. They were, and their message was consistent. How in the world Joseph Smith comes in and now the message has changed? You are not hearing from the same God as the prophets of the Bible. Are you hearing this here? Let me continue. Holy Spirit, please give them revelation. I know this is some heavy stuff, but I pray you understand this. Let me see. Heir of all things, and through him the world was made, the express image of himself. Now this I got to share. So I'm going to show y'all uh, what is the Book of Mormon. This is a book um, yeah, we're not going to get into too much concerning the Book of Mormon, but I want y'all to see something. I showed a little bit of this last week, but I'm going to show a little bit more. And now Abinadi said unto them, I would that ye should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. And again, that is not why Yeshua is called Son of God. Amen. Come on. Yeshua, because he was in flesh, was called Son of Man, not Son of God. So that right there shows that Joseph Smith had no idea what he was talking about, and he's a Bible butcher. Let's continue. Son of God, and having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son. Did you read that? So according to them, Yeshua is the father and the son. Well, which is it? Is it that they are separate entities or they are one and the same? That is called modelism. Okay, so which one is it? You'll see that constantly in the Book of Mormon and in this teachings is that, wait a minute. So is Jesus the firstborn of Elohim or is Jesus one and the same? Which is it? I love how the Lord has the false prophets falling on themselves. Do you see that? Now look at this. The father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the son, because of the flesh, thus becoming the father and son. That makes absolutely no sense. If he is the father, how is he conceived? That doesn't make sense. If he's the father. Because he was conceived by the power of God and the son because of the flesh. That makes no sense. So... Because he was conceived by the power of God, he's the father. And because he is flesh, he is son. Are you kidding me? No, that is false doctrine all around. 
He is the son because son also means heir. Heir also means, oh my goodness. Heir also means like prince or next right hand man, if you will. That's why he's called the son. Son is an office. Sonship is an office. That's why the Bible says that creation is yearning for the manifestation of the sons of God. Meaning it's waiting for us, the body of Christ, to realize who the son of God is and who we are in him so that we can operate in sonship as the God wants, as God the Father wants, okay? So that right there is wrong, but let me continue. And thus the flesh become a subject to the spirit. Oh no, my bad. And they are one God, yea, the very eternal father of heaven and earth. And thus the flesh become a subject to the spirit or the son to the father being one God, suffereth temptation and yieldeth not to the temptation, but suffereth himself to be mocked and scourged and cast out and disowned by his people. Do you see that? So he became subject to the spirit, son to the father. But wait a minute. Who did he become subject to? Because if he is the father, who did he become subject to? Mormons, I need you to answer me. Who? Let him cook. Let him cook now. Let him cook. I said let him cook. Who did he become subject to if he is the father? Let me show y'all the next thing. We're going to go to Mosiah 16. This is out of the Book of Mormon. This is not a Christian source. Okay? Does this look Christian to you? Hello? This is from their own website. I did my due diligence. I did not just go and get... Um, crazy stuff. This is from their own sources. Check this out. Let's read right here. Um, uh, let's do 13. And now ought ye not to tremble and repent of your sins and remember that only in and through Christ ye can be saved. Okay. Sounds good, right? That sounds Christian. That's actually a very good question. Actually, not necessarily, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll explain that later. Therefore, if ye teach the law of Moses, also teach that it is a shadow of things which are to come. Okay. Teach them that redemption coming through Christ the Lord, who is the very eternal father. So there it is again. It's saying he is the father. But if you look in the scriptures, the father and the son, they are part of the Godhead, but they are separate. Yeshua not once said, I am the father. He said, I and the father are one, but one does not mean they are the same person. One in the Bible means an agreement and perfect agreement or union. Watch this. I'm going to show you. Let's go to John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth is experience. No, I'm going to come back to that. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5, 6 through 12. What does this say? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. It is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is the truth. There are three who testify in heaven, the father, the word, and the Holy Spirit. And the three are one, meaning that they are in agreement. They are not the same thing. They are in agreement. Just like this, there are three that testify on earth the spirit, the water, and the blood. Now, is the water blood? No. Is blood spirit? No. Is spirit water? No. 
Spirit, water, and blood are three separate things. And the three are one, but they're in one body. You have a spirit, you're made up of water, and you have blood. Thank you. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. That means if you are willing to listen to a jagged prophet, false prophet like Joseph Smith, listen to God above him. Because that is not what God said of himself. What did God say? But this is the testimony of God, which he has given concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has his witness in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he does not believe the testimony that God gave about his son. What was the testimony God gave about his son? We just read that in the Hebrews chapter one. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. We already seen what God has said about the son. We have already seen what the son is in relationship to the father. So they cannot be one and the same. So the book of Mormon conflicts with the actual teachings of the Bible. They say the book of Mormon is equal to the Bible. It's the continuation of the word of God. No, it is not. Because that right there, just in Messiah alone, and believe me, there's plenty of verses like that, where it sounds like Jesus and the Father are separate. But here in Messiah is saying that Jesus and the Father are one. That's an issue. But now, I think I've finished and proven that point. Let me get to my second point. Who is Joseph Smith? And why is Mormonism Gnosticism? Well, the number one thing that I must say is that Joseph Smith was a Mason. And if you pay attention, you know that Islam, especially Sufi, say they are the true Masons. Okay, so Mason is rooted in occultism and Gnosticism. It is not a Christian. In fact, the Catholic Church went as so far as to say that if you are a Mason and you're claiming to be a Catholic, that that you are no longer a Catholic because you are a Mason. That's how serious the Catholic Church took it. They say you're not even a Christian if you're a Mason. And you know what? I might be inclined to agree because masonry is all it's it is occultic. It is witchcraft. I don't care what they say or try to paint it as. And the thing is, I'll give credit to the Mormons. They did not hide this fact. That Joseph Smith was, in fact, a Mason. So my question is, if he's a Mason, which means that he has Gnostic teaching, Gnostic influence, how in the world is he led by the Holy Spirit? How in the world is he led by the true word of God? If he is a part of this. That doesn't even make sense. Let me show you. Because I got a lot of comments from my last video saying, you didn't pretty, like, all right, Jack Lex. It's called education. I was laying the foundation. Now it's time to cook. This is again from the Church of Latter-day Saints. Look at this. Freemasonry is a fraternal organization that grew out of centuries old European trade guilds. Uh-huh. Also involved in witchcraft and a bunch of other things, but we're not going to go in there. Story based on the brief, blah, blah, blah. Masons, degrees. Ah, here we go. In Masonic rituals, Masons commit to be worthy of trust and to be loyal to their Masonic brothers. In addition to participating in these rituals, Masons meet socially, 
participate in community building activities and make charitable contributions to various causes. Some early Latter-day Saints were Masons. Heber C. Kimball, Hiram Smith, who I believe is the brother of Joseph Smith, and others belonged to Masonic lodges in the 1820s, and Joseph Smith joined the fraternity in March 1842. Soon after he became a Mason, Joseph introduced the Temple Endowment. Oh, isn't that convenient? After Joseph Smith joins the Masons, he comes up with the temple rituals, the temple endowments, which is in the Mormon temple to this day. And you want to say to me that, oh, but the, he, 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 that doesn't prove he's Gnostic. Are you kidding me? The same after he joined Masons, he comes up with a temple endowment. Let's continue. Oh, I'm just starting to cook. The temple endowment. There are some similarities between Masonic ceremonies and the endowment. No dip. But there are also stark differences in their content and intent. Are you kidding me? It's literally the same thing. You just change it differently. Let's let's continue. I want to show something. Uh, let's see. Uh huh. Mason. He joined the Masons. Ba ba ba. Uh huh. Many Latter Day Saints joined. The Nauvoo Lodge. So many Latter-day Saints joined the Masons, is what they sing. This rapid growth made many Masons suspicious that members of the church would dominate the organization in Illinois. Okay, so here it is that Masons started to taking over and Masonry and the endowment. This is my favorite part. On May 3rd, 1842, Joseph Smith enlisted a few men to prepare the space in his red brick store in which the Nauvoo Masons met, preparatory to giving endowments to a few elders. The next day, Joseph introduced the temple endowment for the first time. It literally says the next day. He just does a Masonic ritual. The next day, he brings the temple endowment into the Mormon church. And as we went over, Masonic, Islam, all connected through Gnosticism. Mormonism is no different. I'm trying to tell y'all, pay attention. Y'all need to study. Joseph introduced the Temple of Dalmet for the first time. One of these men, Heber C. Kimmel, wrote of this experience to fellow apostle Parley P. Pratt, who was on a mission in England, we have received some precious things through the prophet on the priesthood. Kimball wrote of the endowment, noting that there is a similarity of priesthood in masonry. What does it say? There is a similarity of priesthood in masonry. He told Pratt that Joseph believed masonry was taken from priesthood, but has become degenerated. Joseph Fielding, another endowed Latter-day Saint and a Mason, noted similarly in his journal that Masonry seems to have been a stepping stone or preparation for something else, referring to the endowment. So literally, all Joseph Smith did was take the Masonic ritual and just took it to the next level. That's all he did. He changed it so that the Masons couldn't sue him for copyright infringement. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But I'm serious. In the sense of he literally just took it and just made it something different. This is out of the Mormon's own mouth. 
that there are similarities to masonry, which the teachings derive from Gnosticism. Because the Gnostics were in early Egypt, the Masons were named after the builders of the pyramid. They wanted to honor the Egyptian roots of Masons. So in other words, Gnosticism rooted to Islam, rooted to Mormonism, Mormon and rooted with Masonry. Hello, that's pretty much cut and dry right there. I could end it right there, but you know what? I'm just getting started. Let him cook now. Let him cook. I said, let him cook. So the first thing that you have to do when, do, when coming into the temple endowment, number one, you got to have your sacred underwear. And on the sacred underwear are marks and symbols on it. That's what makes them sacred. It's underwear that has like symbols and whatever for protection, they say. For spiritual protection. Then what happens is when they when you go into the temple, they do they uh, do something to your head. I think they mark you or something. And then they say you are now a king and priest. Uh-huh. So now let me think about this, okay? So you have to be in the Mormon temple in order to be a king and priest unto God, right? That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says, by his blood, he hath made us kings and priests unto God. So as soon as I accepted Christ, I became a king and priest. I don't need a Mormon church in order to become a king and priest. When I accepted Christ, I became king and priest. And none of those king and priests in the Mormon church can break principalities, powers, can deliver, can do nothing. You don't have the authority of a king of a spiritual king. So number one, you're out. And then when you're in the Mormon temple, you have to learn secret handshakes and codes and stuff like that. Because as you go into the spirit realm, you're going to encounter angels, as they say, angels. And you have to know the secret handshake in order to get past that realm of the spirit into the next realm of the spirit. So you have to learn all the secret codes, handshakes. You have to do all the rituals that are required to get you into the spirit realm. Okay. And Gnosticism, or in better yet, Sufi Islam does the same thing. They have to learn certain words, certain codes, and certain things like that so that they can command a demon. This time they're specific they can command the demon to open the door to let them in into greater spiritual knowledge and understanding. Hmm. Doesn't that sound familiar, people? It sounds just like Mormonism, except instead of remembering words, you remember handshake. But this is the last thing. Remember what the Bible says. The Bible says that we will know them by their fruit, right? Here's Joseph Smith's root. And this is another connection that he has to um, Islam. But it's not the one that you think it is. And, and shout out to this article uh, by um, CES Letter. <sighs> Out of the 34 women, seven of them were teenage girls as young as 14 years old. Joseph was 37 years old when he married 14-year-old Helen Mar Kimball, 23 years his junior, even by 19th century standards. No, I want y'all to read this. And in case you guys are wondering, Kimball, that sounds familiar. Yes, Kimball is the same Kimball that was a Mason. And get how wicked this is. Kimball actually offered his daughter to Joseph Smith at 14 years old. Let me show, let me show y'all something. 
But why is this thing? This article, I love this. The rule book and revelation for the Mormon God himself to Joseph Smith on polygamy. For they are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth and to bear the souls of men. Let's see what the Book of Mormon says the purpose of polygamy is. For if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people polygamy, otherwise they shall hearken unto these things monogamy. Let's see what Larry Day prophet seer Revelator Brigham Young says the purpose of polygamy is. This is the reason why the doctrine of plurality of wives was revealed, so that noble spirits which are waiting for tabernacles might be brought forth. So basically, let me ask y'all, did Jesus teach polygamy? Did he say that the only purpose for you to have a wife is for you just to have sex and have children and multiply? More importantly, did he say it was okay to go with a 14-year-old? Let's take a look. Helen, let me make this a little bigger because I want y'all to see this. Helen was not the only teen bride of Joseph's. Joseph also married other teenage girls, including another 14-year-old, Nancy Winchester, when Joseph was 37 years old. Joseph's other teen brides include several of his own foster daughters, whom Joseph has sex with, who was Fanny Elder, 16, 17, 17. Joseph's other non-minor foster daughters, 19, 22, 19. And then, hold up. Joseph pulled yet again the same stunt on another girl as he did on Helen and Lucy, this time in 1831 with 12-year-old. 12-year-old Mary remembers after receiving a blessing from Joseph in which he prepared Mary for their eventual marriage. What kind of nonsense is that? A 12 year old receives a blessing and then he grooms her to be his wife. What does that sound like to you? Uh, predatorial? Uh, does that sound like Someone who is endowed with the Holy Spirit, who has the revelation of who Jesus really is. No, that sounds like a cult leader using his power and influence to abuse and manipulate little girls. That's what it sounds like to me. No. I'm, I'm almost done. But why is this in Islam? Well, considering that Muhammad married a six-year-old, consummated the marriage at nine, the fact that Muhammad also took his uh, son's wife to be his wife, the fact that this is a common thing and Gnosticism, you're finding it all over. This is wrong, and this is not of God. I'm just, why am I teaching y'all this? Because you need to know the truth. The Bible says you will know them by their fruit. Look at this. So this is his wives, Brigham Young. Again, 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 16-year-old, 16-year-old, Willard Woodruff, 15-year-old, 15-year-old. Look at this. That's just nasty. I'm sorry. To say that is of the will of God, that is wrong. Absolute wrong. That is absolute wrong. That is not of God. How in the world 
are you going to say that's of God harming young women? manipulating them. You just saw Joseph Smith manipulate a 12-year-old. He manipulated two 14-year-olds. He married his foster daughters. Are you kidding me? No. That is not of God. That is not holy and righteous. And the fact that some Mormons actually believe that Joseph Smith did more for mankind than even Jesus when he was on the earth is one of the biggest heresies and blasphemy I have ever seen. Here's one more thing I want to leave you with, and shout out to Answers in Genesis. And again, if you want to check out all these articles for yourself, click the links in the description. And also click the link in the description if you want all wonderful learning material. Check this out. I'm going to teach you all something. I'm almost done. The Lord is showing me. I'm almost done. Look at this. Uh, this. This article is actually from Answers in Genesis. Okay? So, again, they are a wonderful source. Like I said, I personally use them when I study apologetics, when I prepare for sermons and um, for uh, discussions with other religions. This is personally what I use. So check this out. If you know Mormonism only from the happy family commercials, you have a skewed view of what life is like in many Mormon families. Mormonism is based on earning righteousness for salvation in 2 Nephi 25-23. A verse in the Book of Mormon, they are told it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Let me ask you something. Is that biblical? No. no, it is not. The Bible says in Romans chapter four, it is a faith that it might be by grace that the promise is sure to all the seed, not by what you do, but by what he has done. In Mormon theology and doctrine, people are placed on the earth to be tested by the heavenly father. Those who are Obedient will receive blessings from their God in the present life and spiritual blessings in the future life, depending upon their faithfulness. These spiritual blessings include being promoted to one of the three levels of heaven and future exaltation to become a God, potentially being given their own planet to populate and reign over. All of this comes with a tremendous amount of pressure to perform in the family and Mormon community. You do your best and Jesus will do the rest. This idea of working to earn God's favor and to earn salvation flies in the face of biblical passages like Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, which tells us that our salvation and favor in God's eyes is based solely on the person and work of Jesus Christ, not on our own works. Regardless of how much we do, the Mormons you meet are likely weary of trying to meet an unattainable standard in order to be accepted by their families, their church, and their God. So honestly, I'm doing this because I'm trying to tell Mormons is that, listen, the work is finished. It's not about, oh, okay, I got to do this ritual, this ritual. I got to uh, make sure I do this right and do this and do this. No, it is about a love and union with Christ. Christ has done all the work. It is not my righteousness. It is his righteousness. As soon as I accept that Christ as Lord and Savior, the true Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, son of the living God, to come into my life, to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Then what happened is, is that I began to realize who I am and the reason why this is so important is that the Bible says that he has placed the law in our hearts so that we will not sin against him. It's, and so now my requirement, the two greatest commandments is to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. As long as you love God and you are pursuing those things, it is not that you have to fix yourself up. What happens is, is that the Holy Spirit does the work inside of you and he starts to change you from the inside out, not from the outside in. Ooh, that was good. It is the work done from the inside out, not the outside in. 
In fact, a lot of Mormons, I just want to say this because a lot of Mormons, you believe that, okay, Jesus, after he's raised from the dead, he, he, and he ascends, he goes to America. Well, that's not true because the Bible says that he had to go into heaven in order to send the Holy Spirit. So if he doesn't go to heaven, he doesn't send the Holy Spirit. So he can't be going to America because he had to send the Holy Spirit first. So that right there, your doctrine is twisted. So let's take a look at this real quick. I'm almost done, I promise. Are you all learning something? Let me know. Are y'all enjoying this? Let me know in the comments. Are y'all learning something? Are y'all enjoying this? Are you going to share this with your friends and family? Let me know. Look at this. 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus said it right there. He has to go into heaven. He has to be the high priest. He has to be at the right hand of the father. He has to be there. Why? Because then he can do what? Send the promise of the father, the Holy Spirit, the true Holy Spirit, not this false Holy Spirit that is in the Mormon church. You might say certain things. Oh, well, we have the Holy Spirit. No, you don't. You don't have the fullness of of who the Holy Spirit is because you don't acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is not just the spirit of God, but that he is in the class and rank of God. He is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the one who will lead you into all truth. He will the one who will magnify and he will show who Yeshua really is. And the Bible even says that if any religion, anybody teaches or says that Jesus is not the son of God, that he did not die on the cross, that he did not raise on the third day with all power in his hands, that and that he is seated at the right hand of the father, that he is not only the son of God, but that he is God. If you are not saying that, that spirit is antichrist. And that is the same spirit that influenced Joseph Smith. That is the same spirit that influenced Muhammad. It is the same spirit in Masonry. It is the same spirit in Gnosticism. And I'm done. It's over, it's over ladies and gentlemen.